Um, first of all, it's a great pleasure to be in our second week of the Singapore E Academy. And we are absolutely delighted to have Professor Tony Angi, um, who wears multiple hats. Of course, the one that we're most proud of is his role at the Center of International Law as head of the uh, TRELA program, which is the Teaching and Researching International Law in Asia. And perhaps there might be a chance to ask some questions about the work he's doing because it's very groundbreaking. He's also a member of the NUS Faculty of Law where he teaches uh, public international law. And um, I mean, tech, theoretically he should have been in Utah right now. <laughs> but, I am in Utah right now, <laughs> kind you of. <laughs> <laughs> You're not here? Uh, no, I am in Singapore, but okay, kind of okay. and, Well, all right, that's right. You're virtually in Utah, but physically <laughs> here, because normally he teaches half the year, and he's been there for many years, where he, he's the Samuel D. Thurman Professor of Law, International Law. Um, really, Professor Tony Angi, many of you might have heard of it. He is uh, one of the, if not the leading name in the area of, uh, particularly with the topic that he's going to talk about now, and that is third world perspectives on international law. Um, Twyla, he's been a leader in that, but he's just a, a, a very well-known, recognized expert in many areas of international law, human rights, globalization. He's gonna be talking to us today about international uh, organizations as well, I believe. Um, so, but I have to make mention, I love the title of your book. That's your famous book. I think it's a classic imperialism, sovereignty, and the making of international law, which I think is just a fantastic title and, and a wonderful book. Um, so there's much more I could say uh, about our, our great uh, Professor Tony Angie, but I think I'll let, leave the rest of the time for you to hear what he has to say uh, about uh, this very interesting topic. Please, Professor Angie, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks so much, Nizafa. Um uh, thank you for a very generous introduction. I, I only wish my students shared your views of me because <laughs> they are not they are not at all impressed uh, by my <clears throat> by my teaching and by my incompetence when it comes to technology, uh, which is a particular challenge for me in these difficult times. Um, so that, uh, I'm delighted to be a part of this uh, wonderful initiative uh, which uh, Nidufa and Patricia have uh, taken, uh, which will. Uh, uh, add so much uh, to the Center for International Law and its activities. Um, and also, it's an opportunity to, to meet all of you um, from different parts of the world, many from Asia, but also from Africa and elsewhere. Um, and I understand that uh, all of you, despite your current appearance of shyness, all of you are actually very engaged and active. So I was wondering whether to just start with questions, but I was told that I should say a few things about the topic and then uh, open it up for questions. Okay, uh, so uh, let me see whether my share screen works. Okay. So uh, this is uh, my topic, International Organizations, A Third World Perspective. Let me try and run through some basics um, so that at least we'll have a foundation for a discussion as, as such. So um, um, in terms of an overview, uh, I'm just going to talk a bit Professor about- Tony. Uh, you need to make it on slideshow, yes. Ah, right, okay. Uh, okay, great. Um, so uh, let me just say a few things about uh, this term, third world perspectives. Uh, as Nindifer mentioned, I'm part of a network of scholars and we call ourselves TRAIL, Third World Approaches to International Law. So what I'm hoping to do in this lecture is to present a third world perspective on the activities of international organizations. I'm sure you would have learned a great deal about uh, the work and operations of uh, international organizations from uh, Professor Reinisch, who is a complete expert in this area. And so here I'm trying to present a third world perspective on some of the issues that I'm sure he would have covered. I'll be talking a bit about the pandemic to try and suggest how a third world approach would look at the issues that have emerged as a result of the pandemic. And I'll be looking at the concept of global governance and here, uh, to uh, examine some of these questions in more detail, I'll be looking at the structure of the WHO as compared to the International Monetary Fund. And then I'll be looking at this issue of reforming international institutions and a rough conclusion. Okay, so uh, 
very conscious of time. Um, I'll just say a few things about Twail because um, uh, not uh, many of you would have heard of Twail. It's a somewhat uh, unorthodox uh, approach to international law, although I believe it is not un I believe it is not unorthodox. I believe it is completely common sense. <laughs> so I would say Twail actually makes more sense than mainstream international law when it comes to dealing with these issues. So some of the basic uh, issues or principles of Twail. Uh, so one of the questions for Twail is how can peoples in the third world use international law? And it's a very complicated question in the sense that traditionally international law has been used to suppress third world peoples. If we look at the history of international law, we see it as a history of conquest and imperialism. And so it becomes a very complex issue as to how a structure of international law that was devised to, to suppress people from the third world can be used by the people in the third world to advance their own interests. So another principle would be, uh, how do we see international law if we view it from the perspective of third world peoples? In other words, there's an official story about international law, which is the story about the peace of Westphalia, about the way in which international law was fundamental to establishing peace in Europe. That's one vision of international law. But if you look at the history of international law in terms of Asia, we can see that international law has been used as a weapon or an instrument to actually facilitate the conquest of peoples in all sorts of parts of Asia and Africa and Latin America as well. So uh, here I will, the third point, international law and institutions. Uh, so here I will just refer to the readings that I prescribed, and I'm sorry, they were too long, but I didn't have the time to uh, edit them. The two articles by uh, Professor Chimney, my colleague, uh, who's been so important for Twail, and my own article about the IMF and globalization. So the basic argument we would make here is that international institutions can be understood in terms of the way in which international institutions were devised to manage third world peoples. In other words, we can see international institutions as being, in many respects, a continuation of the techniques of colonization. So colonization might have been classically uh, 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 furthered by imperial states, you know, England and uh, you know France and so forth. But my argument and Professor Chimney's argument is that international institutions were also devised to achieve the same purposes, except in a different guise. And in order to support that argument, you know, I'll just point you to the articles, and you can raise questions about the articles, which you may or may not find convincing. But um, uh, I'll just refer to those articles in that way. So the fourth point um, that is that international law was created out of the colonial encounter. The doctrines of international law were created for the specific purpose of actually facilitating the exploitation and the conquest and the management of people in the third world. And I think historically that is hard to dispute, although again, you know, this is an open question that we might uh, discuss. And finally, the point would be that some of these technologies continue on. In other words, we would like to think that colonialism finished as a result of decolonization that took place in the 1940s onwards. But uh, the twail argument would be that many of these techniques continue on in a new guise. And the further argument would be that international organizations are one of the mechanisms by which some of these techniques continue. I am not saying that all international organizations are technologies of, you could say, management and suppression. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying that we can certainly understand some international organizations and some activities in these terms. And that's an important aspect of understanding international organizations. Okay, uh, next slide. Okay, the pandemic. So let me try and talk about the pandemic and how a twail perspective would approach the pandemic. Uh, I don't have too much time, but a question we could raise, and I'm mentioning uh, my good friend Hillary Charlesworth article, uh, her article here is, her argument is that international law depends on crisis. In other words, with a each major crisis, we have find new opportunities for the construction of international organizations and new actors and new doctrines. If you look at the history of international law, this is very evident because all the major dates on, of international law are based on crises. 1919, 
the creation of the League of Nations was a product of the crisis of the First World War. The United Nations was a product of the crisis of the Second World War. So now the question is, we are experiencing an unprecedented crisis, and that is the pandemic. What sort of institutions will be created to deal with this pandemic? How should we understand the character of the pandemic? And here I would distinguish between two approaches. The first approach is to say, what we need to do is to focus on the WHO, because the WHO has principal responsibility to deal with issues of health. And that's what we should focus on. So in terms of institutional responses and what international organizations need to do, the focus is on the WHO. My argument or the trail argument more broadly is that the pandemic has exposed all sorts of structural inequalities and injustices, and the crisis is of a much broader character. It is simply that the pandemic has exposed these intersecting crises. And these, these are crises of inequality, racial, gender, economic, political, epistemic. And of course, there is the ongoing crisis of the environment. So those are all the crises we need to address or think about, not just the narrow crisis of the health crisis. Okay, next slide. I want to introduce the concept here of global governance. <clears throat> and uh, by global governance, different people have different, uh, you could say, definitions of the term. But here, I would say governance has to do with the question of how are resources allocated and distributed? And we all know that you know, we all live in a world of rules which say that certain people are paid a certain amount of money and other people are paid other amounts of money. So that's just a basic example of, you know, the rules creating the structures which uh, then generate or allocate resources and distribute resources. Global governance also is uh, deals with the question about uh, how are competing areas or, and principles dealt with. So, for example, uh, international lawyers have been concerned about possible tensions between international trade law and international environmental law. And here the question would be, well, how are those tensions resolved? There are a set of rules and techniques. Who creates those rules and techniques? And again, we can see the connection with resources and allocation. You know, if there's a dispute between foreign investment law and human rights, which wins? Which has the better prospects? So global governance deals with issues like that as well. Um, global governance also empowers certain actors and diminishes others. So I would say, for example, global governance gives extraordinary power to corporations. It gives far less power to individuals. So in the current crisis, corporations can bring action against states for violations of their rights. Migrant workers, cannot bring such actions easily against states under international law for a violation of their rights under international law. Now, the fascinating thing is that if we look at the history of international law, both migrants and corporations were covered by the same area, but we can see a diversion in terms of their different rights, in terms of what they can claim. So again, rules of global governance. Why are human rights diminished? Why are corporate rights expanded? Okay. The further aspect of global governance is that these institutions do not just create rules or manage certain issues, they also create knowledge. So the example I would give here is the World Bank. The World Bank is the most authoritative, you could say, uh, the most authoritative uh, body for many years about the whole issue of development. It had all the experts, it said, this is how you achieve development. So international organizations create knowledge and they exercise a huge amount of authority and power as a result of being able to create knowledge that is presented as authoritative and universal. So global governance, it's basically about who wins and who loses, <laughs> to put it in short terms. Okay, so the WHO is subject now to a lot of criticism. You know, so the, the criticisms have to do with political influence. You know, so for example, the argument is made that um, that uh, the leader of the WHO is beholden to China. And so there's this issue of political interference somehow corrupting the WHO. And these are the principles or the issues that the WHO is supposed to uphold. And 
principles that are the subject of a lot of debate and controversy about um, notification. Did China notify the WHO in the way it should have? Um, and should a public health emergency have been declared earlier? And there are also issues about dispute resolution because there were so many uh, debates about whether particular countries or the WHO itself could be sued as a result of the pandemic. One thing I want to mention here is that uh, beyond anything else, the role of the WHO is to promote global health. And here I want to mention Article 12 of the International Covenant of Economic and Social Rights because it, it articulates the right to health, the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health, the prevention, treatment, and control of epidemics, endemics, and other diseases, and the creation of conditions, important, uh, important language, the creation of conditions which would assure to all medical service and medical attention in the event of sickness. So it's an interesting question to think about the issue of conditions. What are the conditions that are necessary in order to protect the right to health? Okay, <clears throat> next slide. Here, going back to my idea of global governance, what I want to do is to compare the WHO with the IMF in terms of the relative capacities and powers of each organization. So if you look at the WHO, the constitution, the WHO has capacity. The IMF, by contrast, has personality. And personality is far more powerful than capacity. In other words, the IMF is accepted as being an international actor in a much more comprehensive way than the WHO is. If we look at the funding of these different organizations, we know that the WHO has very uncertain funding because I believe that 50% or perhaps even more of the WHO funding is contingent. Whereas if you look at the IMF, the IMF has a very powerful, solid, financial base. <laughs> and this gives it a huge amount of authority and independence. It does not have to go running after different member states every year or different private entities every year to try and get funding. How is it possible, I would ask, to develop a coherent plan, a sustainable plan in terms of global health if you don't have funding? Now, that is not a problem that the IMF faces. If you look at the voting structure, the WHO voting structure is actually very democratic. We have the World Health Assembly, every member has a vote. If you look at the IMF, by contrast, the voting structure depends on financial contributions. And you could say, well, you know, this is very uh, realistic. That's how it should be. The most powerful, those who contribute the most, should have authority. Now, it's very interesting to note that with the IMF, if it if there is an issue about amending the articles of agreement, those articles of agreement can only be amended if 85% of the voting power of the IMF agrees to the amendment. And please note that the US has 17% of the voting power. In other words, it seems really ironic to me that the United States is criticizing the WHO for political interference when the, when the IMF, which was created by the United States, has you could say sovereign power of the United States embedded in the very constitution of the IMF. So um, uh, uh, I can go on and show sort of various other inequalities, uh, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time. So for example, um, the IMF and the World Bank do not have to abide by human rights law. The IMF and the World Bank say, we are only bound by our own constitution and our own constitution drafted in 1944 does not allow us to take into account developments in international law such as human rights and the environment. As a matter of something like international committee, committee, we will do this, but we don't have to, we are not legally bound. Whereas the WHO is a specialized agency of the, of the United Nations. It is in a different relationship with the United Nations. And so as a result of that, the IMF once more is far more independent than the WHO. And this is complicated when it comes to the issues such as adherence to human rights. The World Health Organization embraces human rights and sees human rights as being a fundamental aspect of its activities. The IMF and the World Bank do not. Okay, what is the consequence of this? The consequence of this in the current pandemic is 
we would like to think that all international organizations that all international organizations are actually coordinating in an effective way to deal with the single problem i would say that this idea is profoundly mistaken it is profoundly mistaken because each international organization while while paying some kind of lip service to the crisis is still operating within the logic of its own structure and its own constitution and if we think about that the consequence is something like this so here we have a situation where the imf is providing financial aid to ecuador at the same time the imf is engaged in structural adjustment programs which require ecuador to pay huge amounts of money in interest and in various other ways to alleviate a financial their financial situation so the imf is engaged in this you could say rather ambivalent uh, process of providing aid on one hand but continuing with the structural adjustment and austerity programs which have been an important aspect uh, historically of what the imf has done over the years now again i think there is much more research that needs to be done about all this but i'm simply flagging this issue and the problem is that many countries which are heavily burdened with debt and that debt has complex origins heavily burdened with debt are not in a position to actually provide the health services that are re regarded as fundamental for the protection of their citizens especially in these circumstances so uh, for example imf backed austerity measures starved health sector prior to pandemic so can we see that different institutions are operating according to different logics and while the who is trying to promote health the imf is actually imposing these you could say these economic uh, burdens on countries and of course there's a whole complex history i don't have time to go into that but i just want to make this point <laughs> there's a lot of discussion now in recent times about philanthropy not just the philanthropy of international organizations but of you know the great philanthropists like uh, amazon and so forth and the basic argument is philanthropy or at least one of the criticisms made and i'm presenting it as a criticism is simply that philanthropy is a way of distracting from the underlying structural factors which create the problem in other words we'll give you money as long as you don't question the way in which we operate and the way in which we make our money that is that is the bargain and we can see that this bargain is to be found not just in terms of philanthropy all the people who meet at davos and so forth but also in terms of international organizations okay That's okay so here uh we've now got to a point where the imf itself says the programs that we were promoting throughout the world for many years have been mistaken so there's a whole discussion about neoliberalism and neoliberalism basically consists of opening up capital accounts uh making money uh, you could say extraordinarily mobile and furthermore uh imposing austerity as a way of uh, uh, supposedly establishing fiscal discipline now after a lot of failure the imf itself acknowledges that what it has done is problematic it's a little late isn't it for all those people who were deprived of social programs and everything else uh to now be told oops uh, sorry we made a mistake you know we've got to rethink this next slide please <laughs> but le let me simply say that twail has said for decades twail scholars have have been saying for decades that this is profoundly mistaken so let me just <laughs> uh claim some kind of credit there in terms of this particular issue okay uh no time for this next slide please <laughs> okay so here all i want to point out is uh, the secretary general guterres Mand mandela speech if you look at what the secretary general has said we need a new model for global governance which must be based on full inclusive and equal participation in global institutions and in particular look at the condition of africa africa does not have a single seat in a permanent seat in the security council Africa has been the target of international organizations. International organizations have been extraordinarily active in terms of shaping and reshaping and restructuring African countries. But Africa itself is not 
effectively represented in so many international institutions. So this raises fundamental questions about law, about equality, about participation, about democracy. If all these things are so good, why do we not enjoy these things at the international level as well as at the national level? And then finally, the Secretary General says inequality starts at the top in global institutions. Addressing inequality must start by reforming them. So if I may say so, um, this is a very twail argument. It is an argument that twail scholars have been making for like the last 30 years, if not earlier. <laughs> so what is, you could say in a way very uh, encouraging, but at the same time discouraging, it's very encouraging that it is now surely recognized finally at the highest international levels that what twail has been saying is just common sense. We have been identified as being radical and somehow, you know, uh, uh, extremist and as being, you know, uh, completely misguided in our analysis of international law. I simply want to make the claim that we've seen many of these problems and provided a whole analysis of these problems. And if you look at the literature we've produced over the last 20 or 25 years, you will see it all there. So what is encouraging is that this is being in increasingly recognized in the most official spheres of the United Nations. It is now becoming, you could say, common sense. Why wasn't it common sense before? So in order to understand that, we have to look at the ways in which certain types of knowledge are presented as being authoritative knowledge, and other types of knowledge which are produced by people from developing countries have been, in many cases, marginalized and suppressed, precisely because the 12th position has not been taken into account. In other words, we said, how has international law affected the people in the third world? That should be the foundation of knowledge, not the theories of experts who simply abstract away all these issues of suffering and impoverishment. Okay, next uh, slide, please. <laughs> so what is encouraging here is that we are seeing a shift where the countries that were previously regarded as the most powerful and best governed countries in the world have in fact experienced this crisis in a very, uh, in a very problematic way. So what is really interesting is that it is sometimes the poorer countries which don't have the resources which have handled this pandemic very effectively so far. Whenever I say anything about the pandemic, I use the word so far at the end of the sentence because we don't know what's going to happen. But Vietnam has been very successful, despite the outbreaks it has suffered, in trying to deal with this issue. Look at what's happening in the UK, you know, wave after wave of crisis. And of course, look at what's happening in the United States. So in other words, what we're seeing is a kind of odd kind of power shift where structures of governance that were thought to be fundamental have been proven to be very inadequate. It's been the classic case <laughs> Um, it's been the classic case that um, uh, the West has been seen as the model that should be followed by developing countries. And I'm trying to suggest that if we look at some developing countries, yes, there are some developing countries which are very badly hit, very badly hit, massive inequality and so forth. I'll come to that. But we can also see examples of developing countries with very few resources who have managed this crisis better than countries which have far more resources. So what I'm suggesting is that we need a shift in epistemic, uh, you could say, uh, outlooks to say maybe we should look to those countries. You know, Sri Lanka uh, has been doing relatively well, again, touch wood, uh, so far, uh, in this very difficult situation. Because despite everything, you know, Sri Lanka has a fundamental health service in place. Okay, next slide, please. <laughs> okay. Um, here, I want to talk about the concept of solidarity, because I feel that this concept is fundamental to the way in which we address this pandemic. So here, what I'm suggesting is that the idea of solidarity is an idea that third world scholars have been trying to promote. So here uh, we have uh, the independent expert on human rights and international solidarity. And it is my friend, uh, Professor Obiora Okafo, who is the special rapporteur. Um, but that is not the only reason why I want to give prominence um, uh, to, this, uh, uh, to this particular initiative. So, uh, Professor Okafor 
So in other words, solidarity can provide a new set of principles that will help us deal with this issue. And that is an important contribution to keep in mind. We need, we need new ideas, and this might be a new old idea. Next slide, please. Okay, sorry, uh, uh, that's another version. The next slide, please. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I've already talked about the conclusions. Uh, so uh, I think I'm running out of time. So let's go to the next slide. <laughs> okay, so this is my final slide. So what I want to suggest is that, you know, here I am talking as an international law scholar who has got all these qualifications and all these uh, different, you could say, uh, uh, different forms of expertise. I just want to say that None of that really counts as far as I'm concerned. What to me is much more inspiring is what these very ordinary people are doing. These are migrant workers. And we know that in India, as a result of the immediate lockdown that was imposed in India, migrant workers within India were left stranded. They were the people who were facing the most difficult circumstances. What I find extraordinary and very moving about this story is that these people who are the most marginalized, the migrant workers, the most helpless, it is these people who demonstrate the human attributes of solidarity and you could say, um, and humanity for want of a better word. They say, yes, we are suffering in all these different ways, but our pets mean so much to us. It is the poorest people who demonstrate a form of solidarity that I think, uh, you know, no representation about expertise and qualifications and all the rest of it can match. So again, going back to my presentation about 12 perspectives, it is these people that we should be learning from as to the foundations of a different and yet powerful idea of humanity, which is still very much within us, despite the fact that we are, I guess, so preoccupied with self-interest and consumption. It's a world based on consumption. It's a Lockean world, John Locke, property, the individual as property owning. That is the foundation of the world that exists at the moment. But all I want to say is I'm inspired by these people who suggest there is another humanity. And the question is whether international law and whether international institutions can learn from the examples that these people have so powerfully provided us with. Thank you. I now take questions, and I think a few have already emerged. Thank you so much. Can I say that, I mean, that was a wonderful lecture. I could hear it again, and we could go on on this, to be honest. Uh, and you really, you've taken international law, which sometimes for some people is abstract, international organizations, kind of the structural, technical concept or reality and brought us down to people and humanity and solidarity. And, and I have to say that uh, thank you because I think it's important to remember that law does have some meaning as well in international law. So there's a lot, but there are a lot of questions. So I won't go on and, and make my own comments, but I have to mm -hmm. say that um, uh, there's a lot of um, thought provoking uh, slides and comments you made. So let's have a quick discussion everyone because this is a great issue. Um, let's see, I know we have written, and I know there may be some who want to ask live. So let me start with uh, a written question. Sure. Uh, we did have the first one about yeah. who. Should we start with that? Um, if the um, WHO was built to fail, as some have said, yeah. will the pandemic crisis result in a competing organization being set to replace the WHO? You know, I really feel that it's uh, too early to tell. <laughs> Um, so a couple of issues here. We do know that there's going to be an investigation and an inquiry of the operation of the oh, We lost your voice for some reason. Oh, sorry. Um, okay, no, starting. Okay. Um, so, so we know that there's going to be an independent inquiry into the operations of the WHO. Australia has called for that and that has been accepted. Let's keep working on that. I do not think that a new institution will achieve very much for this simple reason, that the factors which have led the WHO to be constructed in this way still operate. In other words, 
no very few countries would want an effective WHO to be in existence because that effective WHO will have a huge authority over what happens within a country. And countries are very jealous of their sovereignty. And, you know, uh, diseases begin in Asia or some third world country, and that these diseases then spread to the rest of the world. If you look at what the League of Nations did, in relation to diseases, that was the outlook. The irony of that was that the great pandemic of 1918, 1919 began probably in the United States. So can we see again the issue of the bias of, or the structure of international institutions saying the third world is the problem? And sometimes it is the problem, no question. But it is also the case that in, in, in many significant instances, it is the developed world at West that is the problem and that developed world is not really willing to allow an international organization such as the WHO to have intrusive powers. And of course, developing countries have their own preoccupation with maintaining sovereignty. So I think it's a very good question. And I, that's all I can say at this point of time. Countries want to maintain their sovereignty. And, and so control. that's the ongoing issue. Yeah, and I think, um, and then just the points you raised about the contribution of countries and the issue of authority in international organizations also played out in the WHO. Uh, the US is the yeah. biggest contributor of states, but it turns out that second is Bill Gates uh, Foundation. So it's interesting. But anyway, we'll go sure. on because there's more, there's more questions. Um, I'm going to allow a live question next because we do want to uh, encourage live questions. And I think it was um, Abhinand Siddharth uh, from India who would like to ask their question. Well, you're all live, but meaning speaking, actually, not writing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm inviting you to identify yourself and ask your question in person. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor, for the wonderful presentation. I am Abhinand from India. Hi. I'd like to hear the Twail approach on whether the United Nations has been successful in maintaining order and justice. In particular, I had uh, three points which I'd like to okay. just bring out. The first being that uh, issues of peace and security has been dealt by the Security Council and uh, the, the resolutions of the Security Council have been binding in nature as compared yeah. to the GA resolutions which are just uh, recommendatory. Yeah. The nuclear framework where uh, after 1967 uh, states Basically, the P5 came together and they came up with the whole structure, not allowing other nations to come up with their own nuclear facilities. And third one is the human rights uh, regime, where the standard of civilization argument has been put forth and the universality of uh, the UDHR itself. So I'd just like to hear your perspective on this. Well, um, I think each of those particular issues would be the subject of a lecture. You know? so, uh, so you want to talk about human rights, you want to talk about the NPT, and you want to talk about war and peace. These are not small issues. Um, so the 12 scholars would say the United Nations is important. And so 12 scholars are not in the business of saying everything Western is bad, or that every aspect of international institutions uh, should be condemned. So that's why I said at the beginning that we can see a strand of international institutions which have been focused on managing the third world and the IMF and the World Bank present themselves as easy examples. There's a lot I can say about what you, uh, you, what you pointed out, Abhinath. I know, so for example, uh, you know, can we see that the Security Council presents the same structural bias? In other words, if the permanent members engage in any type of illegal action when it comes to the use of force, there is nothing the Security Council can do because of the veto. So all that the Security Council does is it manages the, the less powerful countries. <laughs> and so you can see that bias even in the Security Council. In terms of the issue of human rights, well, um, I've written about this and maybe you know, it's, it's a complex issue, but I, I do feel that human rights are important. For example, the right to health right now, what could be more important? And I'm not going to say, oh, that's a Western concept or something like that. If we have a look at many developing countries, it is developing countries that have said, we think the right to health is fundamental. So in Sri Lanka, for example, there was universal health care at a very early stage of Sri Lanka's you know, history after independence. And that has been fundamental. 
you know, so it's we do need some nuance in terms of the specific issues. About the NPT, of course, the argument is countries can sign on to the NPT. India has not. And uh, frankly, I wish that the ICJ decision involving India had gone in the opposite direction, <laughs> because I don't think that nuclear weapons are good for anybody, even though they might provide individual countries with a kind of status boost, like you know, winning the World Cup or something like that. But uh, that's not good for the world overall. And well, I think the IPL is starting, isn't it? The IPL is going to be played. OK, <laughs> let's yes, see. Yes. Will the Royal Challengers finally make it? I don't know. Uh, okay. I'm from Bangalore myself, so I hope so they do. <laughs> okay. Well, Mumbai Indians. Oh, Lasit Malinga is not playing for them, isn't it? Okay, forget about that. I have to pick a new team. Okay, uh, other questions? Yes, we do. We have quite a few questions, actually. I have a question from, uh, hold on. Uh, oh, I might miss one here. Uh, Bernadette Iodu from Singapore. Where does corporate social responsibility feature in global governance? Does it remedy the situation of shrinking human rights versus corporate expansion? Uh, Another sorry. easy question. <laughs> uh, 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 sorry, uh, sorry. I, I was just having a look at the chat. Uh, sorry, uh, you know, I was distracted because there was an interesting question about Twail being political correctness, you know, which I feel like okay. I also have you, you're, you can take your choice. Um, so, so could you please, uh, I, I'll deal with both. Uh, the human okay. rights question was, it's about corporate responsibility, where it features in global, in global governance, yeah. and does it remedy the situation of shrinking human rights versus corporate expansion? Again, a very large question, and I think we need to do a lot of empirical work about this. Um, but my feeling is that, you know, corporate social responsibility is, uh, is not quite as uh, you know, we know the whole struggle about whether there should be just guidelines or a treaty. And frankly, I'm on the side of a treaty. So you know, that's all I'll say. But I think we do need uh, more. And, and for a very simple, basic reason, corporations have rights under international law. They have extensive rights under international law, thanks to bilateral investment treaties. I can't see why they don't have obligations. Simple point there. Um, but um, I do feel... I do feel responsible corporations might have a role to play. You know, if 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 um, if this is taken seriously, but I still feel we need a lot more empirical evidence than I have access to. The question about twelve and political. Okay, um, uh, I think there's a question about. Uh, um, okay. Um, uh, let me just try and deal briefly with all this. Okay, uh, many of my, we've often debated about whether international law can really be said to be international. Uh, so, Tangi uh, uh, Shigonko from Namibia, I agree with you. Uh, in other words, that international law can't be really be said to be international if there isn't effective participation by all the, you could say, states of the world. And there are lots of problems in terms of ensuring that effective participation. Um, Sorry. Um, okay, here's the. Uh, uh, so from China, uh, my question is: Is TWAIL supposed to be on the opposing side of how the Western perceives international law? How to coordinate or harmonize TWAIL with the other approaches to international law? Has TWAIL become a kind of political correctness in international organizations? So I would say no. You know, it's a very interesting issue here that any kind of critique now is presented as being political correctness. It's a way of silencing any effective critique. <laughs> so people who talk about race, they're condemned as being extremist. <laughs> we can see this happening all the time. So it's a very easy way to try and you know, marginalize again. And trade is used to this. We've been marginalized by the mainstream. And to say that trade is political correctness in a situation where it is just emerging in lots of different arenas is, I think, mistaken. OK, so I'll simply say that. The question about how TWAIL can be harmonized with other approaches. So TWAIL does not see itself as being in a situation of antagonism, although there are certainly differences. And if there are no differences, there is no TWAIL. But we would like to think, and this is something that TWAIL scholars going back to the 1950s and 60s have always maintained, saying, we have this position, 
why can't we actually discuss these issues and work something out? So it is encouraging now that even more traditional international lawyers and organizations are actually starting to embrace or acknowledge. It's not even embracing TWAIL. It's simply acknowledging what is happening in the world. That's what it is. It's not about TWAIL. It's about acknowledging how inequality is increasing, how the system of political economy is destroying the environment. That's not TWAIL. We are just pointing to facts that all of you are experiencing. We are presenting a set of analytical tools that would help us understand this and present it in a way that it becomes a subject of real scrutiny rather than simply being dismissed. Okay, so that's my response to that question. Um, and by the way, China, I'm not sure whether China is, the, China is not the answer. Let me also simply say that in terms of, you know, how the Chinese vision of the world might shape the international order. Because I still think that uh, there are lots of issues that need to be addressed. And so I welcome China's presence because it's a way of actually um, you know, changing global structures and hopefully for the better. But I'm also interested in the question about Chinese international organizations like the Asian Infrastructure Bank. I'm not sure whether the Asian Infrastructure Bank is actually in many ways significantly different from the World Bank in terms of the issues I mentioned, in mm -hmm. terms of issues of, of respecting human rights, mm -hmm. of respecting environmental issues, of allowing for the review of what happens. So can we see that I, you know, China is in many respects, I would say, following in what the West has already done, even while presenting itself as being different, even though in some important respects it is different, okay? So that's a kind of extended uh, response to that uh, question. Um, let's see. Um, my goodness, I don't think I'll be able to handle all the questions that are remaining here. Well, Charlie, there was one here, then. This is something uh, for the region about yeah. Twill's view on mm. regional organization, especially, especially ASEAN. So is there a 12 view on this? So um, uh, I would say yes and no. <laughs> um, so on, I think it's a very good question because perhaps regional organizations can deal more effectively with particular issues than international organizations. With the pandemic, I feel that regional organizations can achieve something, but in the end, the pandemic really is global. <laughs> You know, so there has got, got to be international coordination and not just regional co coordination. Um, I feel that ASEAN is important as a different way of conducting an international, you could say, a regional organization. And it's interesting. I mean, it has achieved uh, various things. I mean, in terms of foreign investment, you know, we've got the Asia, uh, uh, the uh, foreign investment treaty and so forth. Um, so here, I would say, it's important that regional organizations do combine or uh, unite to try and present their visions of the world. I don't always agree with what happens, but I think that's important. And I should also point out here that we should, ASEAN should be looking not just to the EU, but to Africa, because lots of interesting and important developments are, developments are taking place in African regional organizations, dealing exactly with issues of foreign investment, human rights, and so forth. And so, what my broad approach, uh, which is also evident in Trila, is that it is collaboration and cooperation among southern countries and regional organizations, which might help generate new ideas, rather than always looking to the north as being the solution. Um, other questions? I think we're pretty well come to the okay. end, but if I can just then kind of uh, uh, ask you, um, I think, it's interesting the points uh, raised, and we're, as you know, I'm a Law of the Sea scholar actually, sure. and I know that the Law of the Sea Convention, the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention, was very much influenced by, at that time, of course, the emerging colonial uh, countries, what we would call third world countries, um, and it had a huge influence. Yeah. Was that kind of was that a peak in influence? What happened? Okay, uh, so here, uh, you know, uh, it's a very interesting, uh, very interesting history, which I feel I need to uh, learn about from you, Nilifer, and other law of the sea <laughs> specialists. Uh, but let me say, simply say briefly, yes, the law of the sea was the great, uh, in the 1970s, 
uh, it was part of the great initiative of creating a new world order. And we had you know, giants uh, from uh, developing countries, including Singapore's own Tommy Cole, uh, who uh, were pioneers in this area, uh, Professor Jayakumar, Prof, uh, Prof Cole. Uh, and let me be a little bit uh, of a nationalist here, uh, and also mention, mention Shirley Amarasinghe, who was from Sri Lanka, and uh, Chris Pinto, also from Sri Lanka, who were also involved in this. Um, and um, of course, our colleague from Fiji, who was so important in this as well. In so London. Yeah. All, all these uh, uh, different uh, third world giants. So of course, the issue is what happened to the deep sea bed regime. And we had this situation where the United States kept changing things and did not going on. And now we have a deep sea bed regime. Let me have a glass here. <clears throat> I'm sorry, this is a, uh, I, I need a glass to demonstrate this point. A lot of the sea specialists said, we spent years negotiating for this. Does it show? We spent years negotiating for this. And when it came to the deep sea bed, what we got was this. <laughs> In other words, it wasn't at all what the developing countries wanted. And this is another important issue to suggest that developing countries are not short of ideas, because that's another, another way of criticizing twail. The argument is, Twail only criticizes, it does not provide alternatives. There have been endless alternatives if we look at the history of what has happened since the 1960s, and they've all been suppressed. So the question here is, is the pandemic going to be a situation in which those alternatives are going to be allowed expression, or are we going to relapse into the existing structures of power, given that we know that those existing structures of power already are biased? And this is what, go this is what the Secretary General himself, I keep clinging on to the Secretary General. <laughs> you know? um, so he's, uh, he's, he's a very, I, I guess to me, uh, it was really impressive that he came up with, uh, he was bold enough to say these things, to say that this is structurally biased. And, you know, as I said, you know, I would like to think now that this is common sense. And the question to me is, why is mainstream international law so slow to actually recognize what is happening on the ground? Thank you so much. We have about three minutes left. If someone would like to jump in and ask one final question, we have time for one more question. And I and, and you should have lots of questions. Yes, Ibu Sharma. Yeah, um, thank you, Professor Raji. I actually went to law school when Professor Chimney was heading the law school in Calcutta and Twail was very much part of uh, my imagination and uh, understanding of the world in law when I started law school. What a tragedy. Uh, you know, there, yes. There's no hope for you now. <laughs> uh, and my question is in that way, you know, um, I mean, the Lockean idea of property rights is what has captured the imagination of the world and is, is very much how we think about a capital and property, which at the end of the day, to my mind, are uh, legal fictions. Uh, you know, uh, mm. money supply has been increased by the feds as they please in the United States and other such world over. Uh, but human well-being, uh, and 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 uh, you know, Rousseau talks about how humans are inherently good, and human uh, uh, and caring for each other is inherent to human nature. It was property rights that sort of changed uh, how we think about uh, the survival of the fittest and competition and all of that. Uh, so, how can we start thinking about values such as uh, compassion, empathy, love, nonviolence, and even Professor Chimney who talks about. Uh, self-emancipation and the spiritual self in the context of international law and situate the human being uh, there? Um, so my rough answer is to go back to my slide and to say it is there, it is here, it is the way in which we relate to all, each other. You know, so I would almost say that um, there's this process of alienation <laughs> where in our everyday activities, we relate to each other with kindness, with sympathy, with support. <laughs> and I must say that, um, I know this is a large discussion, but I do feel, you know, we can see fragmentation and everything else, um, uh, uh, you know, to deal with these questions. And um, so uh, in those circumstances, um, uh, You know, I find, okay, from a personal point of view, and this is something of a cliche, I find it is, you know, people that we might, you know, the circumstances regard as somewhat ordinary who have these virtues in great abundance. 
I think we need, that's why we go back to the basics, the fundamentals of our everyday life to say, isn't this something that we need to see reflected in the structures that govern us? So that's my quick response. Uh, I think there's a question that I've been reminded um, about uh, Winston Chu. Uh, sorry, I, yeah, I did see it in the, I'm just finding it. Um, okay, and his question. Uh, his question is, COVID is aggravating poverty in the third world. The fragmentation of states into fair states have become more acute. How would the UN and other IOs address this problem, which if not resolved, will lead to more problems, including the surge in economic refugees and other humanitarian crises? So it is certainly the case that uh, we can see, uh, you know, COVID aggravating poverty. And it is not just in the third world. I mean, I think we are coming to a point where this term failed state now, the idea of a failed state is an idea of, you know, developing countries are failed states. I think we really need to understand what the causes of these failed states are. So, for example, you know, we can see many African countries have been condemned as failed states. If we look at the history of these countries, we can see that they've been subject to endless intervention. Look at Libya. Libya is a failed state after NATO started bombing and destroyed the place. And that's caused a massive influx of people you know into europe so europe creates a pro creates a problem which and doesn't want to deal with the consequences <laughs> let's look at iraq and afghanistan the major refugee flows come from iraq and afghanistan why are they failed states they are failed states because they were subject of a completely illegal attack by the united states and also by you know, some of the allied forces. In my view, the Afghan war was not legal. That's my view, but there can be a debate about that. There's very little debate about the fact that Iraq was an illegal war. So when we talk about failed states, we really have to ask the question, what were the causes of these failed states? Now, of course, that then presents enormous pressure on institutions such as, you know, the, uh, the, uh, uh, so the whole question about refugees. How do we deal with refugees? And that's a huge problem. But the only thing I want to say at this point of time about refugee flows is there's a huge amount of publicity given to refugee flows into Europe. If we look at the actual statistics, the vast majority of refugees are actually housed in the Middle East itself. It is developing countries which are actually harboring the most number of people who are refugees even though what we get are very dramatic stories about Europe and the United States and so forth. So then can I change the script a little bit? Can I change the script in this way and say, many of the causes of refugee flows emanate from the West. And by the way, I have a whole, there, there's a whole interesting literature about the IMF and how the IMF and structural adjustment programs of the IMF in Africa have increased social and political pressures in all sorts of ways. So that's another form of intervention, precisely the international organizations that I spoke of. So when we talk about international organizations, to go back to my theme, let's not just focus on the United Nations. Let's focus on what the IMF and the World Bank have done, because there are scholars who argue that the activities of these organizations have created massive social tensions. Look at the tensions that have been created within Europe itself as a result of austerity. You know, so the interesting thing now is that Europe is being subject to the same programs that the developing countries were subjected to for decades, austerity. And austerity has caused massive social dislocation, a, a, diminu a diminution in health services and everything else, and in different ways contributed to the rise of nationalism. Okay, so then let me say that, and, and this is not a complete explanation. Let me also make that clear because in many cases, developing countries have certainly and absolutely contributed because of their corrupt leaders and everything else to their own miserable situation. There's no question about that, okay? And that is also a concern of Twitter. We don't simply say it's all the West, right? But we also do want to say, let's consider what is happening because it is the Western narrative that is driving the way in which international organizations are operating. And so we have a situation where violence is externalized. We can see this in the Iraq war, a massive war, $4 trillion. The United States has spent $4 trillion in conducting these wars. <laughs> and in these circumstances, 
the argument is we can inflict massive damage overseas, but we don't want to face any of the consequences ourselves in terms of these refugees actually entering our borders. And we can see that even in terms of refugees, that new doctrines are being developed in refugee law to try and make sure that refugees from the South are not really encouraged to try and make it to the North. And our friend, Professor, G Professor Chimney, has written a brilliant article about this whole issue. So then the, there is a question about, can the United Nations play a role in saving failed states after all this? You know? And um, here, the record is not great. You know, um, if we look at this whole issue about state building, look at what's happening in Afghanistan. Huge amount of money spent, and yet the war continues. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a, very, it's a very good question, but the answer is very complex, and it will take me a bit more time to try and go into all the complexities there. But all I want to do is to kind, kind of also suggest we need to think about this whole concept that we use so, so almost self-evidently, the concept of failed states. There's a whole narrative which supports that concept, but I would question the narrative of this whole question about how we understand state failure and how we can understand the role of international organizations in dealing with that. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Angie. I think we should all be, we'd be in a room, we'd all be clapping, so we can at least no. do that. Uh, I think this has been beyond stimulating so much. Uh, uh, it's important, uh, and I really appreciate, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure the participants do, that we have one side, which is our, which we have to have, you know, the traditional international law, the international organizations, the structure, but to have this different dimension, kind of the reality as well. Uh, and there's too many points, but the IMF, absolutely. And that now they've admitted to failing. And I come from Turkey, which suffered also from the IMF. <laughs> so, and the refugee issues, we have 4 million refugees in Turkey. Jordan has 2 million. And Europe can't deal with a few thousand. <laughs> so well heard, well said. Um, but I'm afraid we have to stop here. Uh, no. Most regrettably, um, but I encourage all our participants to read more about this issue in Professor Angie's literature. Uh, it's, it's such an important area, and we really need to continue this discussion. So thank you so much, Professor Angie, for this absolutely wonderful uh, lecture you gave us today. No, thank you again, and good luck with the rest of the uh, academy. So all the best then. <laughs> By then. <laughs> so thank you everyone. And I guess Jerry Zuway have anything you want to say for tomorrow, but I know we will be meeting again uh tomorrow with uh Professor uh this Rheinish part two <laughs> of international organizations. <laughs> okay. I wish you all and, and thank okay. you thank and thank you again for all the very interesting questions. I don't think I was able to do quite justice to all of them. Uh but uh Okay, uh, good luck with everything else. And it was Thank nice you. to interact with all of you. All the best. Thanks so much. All right, everyone. Have a good evening or a good day wherever you are.